Podcast. 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 Some of you may become somewhat uncomfortable as parts of this film unfold, but I think if you listen carefully, nature has intended that you have to be a healthy, happy sex life is wonderful and terribly We've all experienced curiosity about ourselves and the opposite sex. Who hasn't? Hello, I'm Megan. I'm Marcella. And I'm Colin. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Remedial Sex Ed. Ed. Last week we started a show and tell. Previously on Remedial Sex Ed. We uh, did a show and tell of some three kinks that we had found. A grab bag o kink. Mm hmm. And uh, I brought balloon popping, Marcella brought pet play, and Colin was exploring uh, the fuzzy community, learning Furries. that at furry, did I say fuzzy? You did. That's great. Fuzzy wuzzy I'm, was I'm, bear. I'm, fuzzy, I'm wuzzy, sure fuzzy bear. is also a kink, we just haven't found it yet. His name is Fuzzy and he's a bear, and he's yeah. definitely into the furry community. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like I would consider fuzzy or like, I, I think that bears I would associate more with the leather mm. community, so like, you know, mm. there's some variation there. Yeah. <laughs> Fuzzy's into a lot. Fuzzy's <laughs> complex bear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But as uh, Colin learned, the furry community is actually less about um, sexuality and more yeah. about wanting to be an animal. It's not a kink until it is. Yep. It's really just a fandom. And so as we started diving into this, um, we started realizing that we haven't really given like a crash course into what BDSM stands for. Despite the fact that Marcella has been a big fan and proponent as we've been going through the episodes. I'm in the community. Yeah, she... I do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she sort of dropped hints and given her perspective here and there, but we haven't really dove in into it. Yeah, so like right. as an opener, uh, I'm going to try to not necessarily be like, hey, this is what I do. These are my past experiences. In case people right. know me, I want you to be able to listen to this and not just like think of me doing it and more just like <laughs> me telling you about um all of the different variations of bdsm and obviously i'm not touching all of the different variations of bdsm because even if this is an hour-long podcast that's not enough time let's start with the actual definition of bdsm absolutely so yeah i used a term last week that probably isn't as inclusive as like the full uh, definition of BDSM. So uh, this week, uh, the full BDSM um, stands for bondage and discipline, domination and submission, sadism and masochism. Mm. Excellent. So each one of the letters partners with the letter next to it. Bondage and BDSM, uh, and I liked, um, I used multiple resources for this. Uh, Wikipedia was a big resource. Um, Historyofbdsm.com was a big resource. Um, there were a couple podcasts that I have forgotten their names at the moment that were also a resource. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so one of the definitions that I liked best was, um, bondage is the practice of consensually tying, binding, or restraining a partner for erotic, aesthetic, or, uh, somatosensory, uh, stimulation. So the different types of bondage, uh, there's bondage for purpose. Um, so when you're actively tying up a partner in order to make body parts accessible, whether to spank or do other types of, um, sadism or masochism uh, th basically what we should start off with is a lot of these things can be uh intersected there's a lot of intersection between bdsm i think that's why it's all associated together under the term bdsm um but yeah so bondage uh for purpose is so that you're tying off specific areas and allowing access for specific body parts now a lot of people i think their very first attempt at bondage would be like fuzzy handcuffs that's like pretty common in like your i don't know sexual starters kit they're available in most like sex shops like next to the like intro into different sex positions chart that mm -hmm. you can see definitely would you consider handcuffing to the bed or tying people up with like a necktie 
as bondage or yes and i actually have a list of um like uh common bondage equipment um so uh bondage can include collars um ropes obviously um we've talked a lot about that but um straps harnesses um it also includes things like spreader bars x frames stocks handcuffs um yeah there's a lot of different ways to bind someone it's not necessarily just binding body parts together it can also be spreading body parts apart um it can be i mean we'll get into this with the other types of bondage um but yeah so there's a lot of different equipment so the next one is bondage for decoration um so uh there's the act of tying somebody up and leaving that way leaving them in that way to be aesthetically pleasing um either for a partner or bondage for decoration happens a lot with kink parties where you have human beings who are part of the who are the art um so you'll leave them tied up in the room um for the entirety of the party and it's not about people interacting with them at all just like setting the mood so as you read various articles on BDSM, they make a point that penetration isn't always strictly a portion of the sexual play. Correct. <laughs> and this Sex isn't always a part of the play mm-hmm. in any way, shape, or form. That's a good point. Okay. Or, well, it all comes back to what our definition of sex is. Mm-hmm. So, so when you say that sex isn't necessarily a part of it, are there times with the bondage for decoration that it's seen more as like art period? without kind of like a sexual arousal associated with it? Not necessarily. Uh, bondage uh, in for decoration is aesthetically pleasing in order to create sexual arousal. Um, when we talk about uh, BDSM not necessarily being sexual, I think we'll see a lot more of that when we talk about uh, dominance and submission. Okay, mm. gotcha. And we did definitely touch on this when we talked about Kimbaku and Shibari. Um, of, t- of not only the knots themselves and the way you tie them being artistic and aesthetically pleasing, but to like isolate body parts in a way that is arousing or pleasing. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, while we're talking about shibari or kimbaku, um, one way of bondage that is far more uh, Eastern culture than is necessarily Western culture is bondage for meditation. Uh, a lot of the time with the Eastern practices of Kimbaku, people will be tied up in a way to sort of remove them from their physical form and allow them to meditate or explore spiritually because um, they, they only have their minds. As a build on to that, I know it's not the same, but um, uh, recently a big craze in the Southern California area, aerial yoga, where you take the aerial silks mm. and you find a way to tie yourself up to not only, I guess, let go of your mind, which I think a lot of people use exercise for, but to also use gravity to help the stretches. Mm-hmm. But yes, yeah, every time absolutely. I get up in the silks, I do think of come back now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Another form of bondage is bondage for torture. Um, and this will also, again, cross over with um, sadism masochism. Um, but tying somebody up in painful positions or leaving them tied for long durations of time um, as punishment. Um, so that can also be associated with discipline as well. I think that covers the types of bondage that I wrote down. I'm sure I'm missing others. Again, I want to come at this with the approach of yeah i know there's so many more things that i can cover we only have an hour if there are things you want us to talk about message us absolutely this is an intro this is not like this is everything that is and always will be yeah (laughs) Yeah. because that is not how sex works (laughs) (laughs) this is because um i read somewhere the statistic that i have in front of me from psychology today is, uh, and I quote, 2 to 3% of American adults play with BDSM, most occasionally, some often, and a few 24 um, 7. That's around 5 million people. <laughs> but percentage wise, 2 to 3% means that a lot of us don't necessarily know what the community is about or what's going on. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that they said, um, even though 2 to 3% admit to being part of the lifestyle, Around 20% report some arousal from BDSM images or stories. So 
there's a lot more of us who I think are lying about it. Maybe. Yeah. Or just like not necessarily calling it BDSM. Like if you Correct. do occasionally use the, the aforementioned fuzzy handcuffs or handcuffs or tying somebody up with a belt or a necktie, mm -hmm. you know, that might be part of vanilla play for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, it's all it's all about that scale again. Yeah, the, all of that would count as BDSM, but people don't necessarily want to call it that because of the stigma associated mm -hmm. throughout yeah. history. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, that is a brief description of bondage. Um, so D uh, associated with bondage is a uh, discipline. Um, uh -huh. So discipline, it does typically relate to a dom and sub relationship, um, which we'll get into. Uh, but basically with discipline, um, it's when somebody fails to meet set expectations or rules and then is disciplined for not meeting those expectations. And that's the difference between discipline and sadism and masochism. Um, sadism and masochism, which we'll get into, is all about um, enjoying getting sexual fulfillment from pain, uh, whereas discipline is literally punishing somebody for doing something. So it's not exactly about like getting them off through pain. It's literally punishing them for doing something bad. So can we step off a little bit just to clarify? Um, with discipline agreements and with all B B BDSM agreements, like this isn't something that you come into without describing or discussing first mm -hmm. you've done something that your partner deems is bad and they start spanking you this is something that you, the two of you have like discussed thoroughly about yeah there what are the set are. expectations yeah with established yeah. safe safe words so like the, the amount of consent going into this is greatly and thoroughly discussed beforehand correct absolutely yeah the the whole everything behind bdsm is based in consent that's why I mentioned that it's typically associated with a dom and sub relationship because uh, during the dom and sub, w when you practice BDSM or when you uh, partner with somebody and create that kind of relationship, um, everything is discussed. Like, do you have hard limits? Do you have soft limits? Um do uh in in discipline specifically it's like well what kind of relationship are we having um is it uh so this is another case of it's not always sexual like there are dom and sub relationships that are if somebody wants to accomplish something in life they can have a dominant who is in charge of making sure that they accomplish that uh, so mm -hmm. there are people who want to study or pursue a degree or do something like that. Um, and they have a dominant who's in charge of making sure that they study a certain amount of hours every day or they complete a test or they do these kinds of different things. And if they don't complete it in the time um, set, then they're punished by their dominant. Gotcha. A really aggressive life coach. Yeah. Like a really close life coach. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Really close. Really intimate. I just wanted to ask, when discipline isn't associated with a dom-sub relationship, how, how is it handled? Without a set dom and sub, um, we have these things called switches, where you may, um, in a specific scenario, in a specific uh, sexual encounter, one might take a dominant role or a more submissive role, and you can play with... Uh, uh, discipline in that way um, versus like having it actually be um, a determined relationship between two people. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think that discipline definitely there is a person who is disciplining someone else. So that's mm -hmm. how you have like a dom and sub. But that doesn't mean that like they have always set that they are the dom and the sub. Gotcha. 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 Okay. Forms of discipline can include um, hot wax, spanking, flogging, caning, electricity, um, edge play, uh, which for people who might not know what that term is, it's basically taking someone almost to completion and then backing off and then continuing to build um, and, and then uh, release stimulation without any se sexual satisfaction. Yeah, we all know what edging is. 
it's one of those things again where like the crossing between people's definitions because someone could see that as kinky. I see that as a way to extend sex for longer. <laughs> uh yeah, absolutely. Um and and again, all of these things kind of intersect in different ways because like Edge play is definitely something that people use in sadism and masochism. A lot of the different ways of discipline are also used in sadism and masochism. Um, Okay, so next one, we have like nipple and breast torture, uh, which can include binding the breast or male or female like nipple clamps, nipple weights. You can vacuum. um, And some people find these things to be pleasurable and some people find these things to be extremely painful. Um, and then on penises and balls, there's cock and ball torture, which can include ball crushers, cock harnesses. Um, one that I find super fascinating that I didn't know about until my research today was a humbler. Um, and you can kind of think of it as like a metal bar and it's, um, when a man is kneeling and then it's kind of like a spreader where you put it at the base of the balls and then um, it's a long enough piece of metal that it goes behind the man's butt so that it it's pulling away from the body and if the man tries to extend his legs and not be in a kneeling or crouching position anymore it pulls further away from his body and actually ow. causes more pain ow Ooh. ow ow i have another <laughs> pair of balls that sounds so painful <laughs> um so that was just that was a new one that i i didn't know about and i just needed to tell people because i was fascinated <laughs> great name the humbler it will the humbler. force it will you to be humble humble you. <laughs> yeah um and then uh with uh pussy torture there's obviously labia weights um pussy hooks uh which can also be incorporated in uh bondage by the way where you have like a hook that enters the vagina and then you tie a woman's body in different ways in order to help support weight um to to the hook or to uh uh the ceiling and then you can have people like hanging by their vaginas um on a hook um and then the the one for uh that doesn't seem vag- safe uh, yeah, it, it totally can be. It it totally depends okay. on like how you uh, how you tie people, um, and then the the one that I hadn't heard about until researching today that I found freaking fascinating for people with vaginas uh, was figging, um, which has been around forever, and I have just never heard of it. But figging is when you insert uh, ginger into the vagina or anus to create a burning sensation. Oh my gosh. Okay, I see you. That that sounds a little unsanitary. I'm not saying I mean, you eat the ginger after. No, I'm just. <laughs> like or do. Goes in there. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Okay, just sounds like a way to get an infection. I mean, it's I def- think having a vagina is a way to ha- get an infection. Okay, fair dues. Yeah, fair. Um, honestly, <laughs> I think that that's probably cleaner and easier than any type of chocolate play, which is super common. Oh. Also, yes. Yeah, keep chocolate outside of the vagina, just like as a rule. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's a good rule. It's a hard rule to follow sometimes, but it's a good rule. (laughs) It's a good, it's a real good rule. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, yes, so those were some forms of discipline that I found fascinating and wanted to highlight. Um, Next, D and S, um, dominance and submission. Um, so the definition here is a set of behaviors, customs, and rituals involving the submission of one person to another in an erotic episode or in a lifestyle. Um, so like I said, this is where we can get into stuff that isn't necessarily sexual. So there are people who do domestic servitude where they will come in and they will, uh, clean somebody's apartment and then leave and there's no sexual interaction whatsoever there they just like want to submit themselves in the way of just cleaning someone's apartment um there are people who do uh financial submission which we talked about a little bit last week where they will give all of their financial accounts to somebody else so that that person can spend their money or only give them an allowance of the money that they make or like there's a ton of different variations there um, and then there's like 
consensual, like sexual uh, dom submission um, where uh, the dom uh, tries to explore the submissive's boundaries. And it's um, I think the number one thing with uh, domination and submission is the relationship is really about the dom teaching or training the submissive in a specific way. Um, so much of it has to do with learning, like the scenario that I said earlier, where there's somebody who like wants to pursue an education or something. And the dom, the dom is in charge of, um, making sure that they reach those goals. So much of that is the dom then does the research of like, okay, here are the steps that you need to take. Here is how much I want you to do at a specific time. The relationship is very much centered around training and education. That can mean sexually or it can mean not. So other forms of domination and submission include dehumanization, like animal play or pet play, which we talked last week. Age play, where you have um, the scenario of like an older person and a younger person. Um, You can like do baby play, um, that kind of things. That also incorporates daddy-daughter relationships, um, which can be two different things, uh, by the way, like daddy princess and daddy brat. Um, So princesses are a type of sub that specifically enjoy the adoration that comes with being a submissive. They want somebody who's like taking care of them. They like to be like a prized possession, that kind of thing. And then there's brats who specifically enjoy testing the bounds and like getting punished or uh, again, everything is within consent and there's ways to say no, um, but it not be a hard no and that's when you get into like um safety words and safety actions so that if somebody is incapable of actually like speaking the safe word there's a way for them to communicate hey no we're hitting my bounds uh but yeah so there's ways for brats to be like no i don't want to or make me or that kind of thing and then get punished and receive sexual domination from that And then there's also, when we start talking about dominatrixes and that kind of thing, um, there's like enforced chastity, there's chastity belts uh, for uh, people with vaginas, and then there's also, I can't think of the term for it right now, um, but like a chastity sleeve uh, that you basically put around the penis and it keeps the penis from like being able to get fully erect. It's like metal that goes over the penis. And then there's obviously uh, verbal humiliation. There's public humiliation, like putting your submissive in public scenarios that might be embarrassing to them. One way of doing this would be like making them wear um, a butt plug tail out on the streets so that everybody around them knows what's happening. But that can be like very embarrassing for the submissive. Um there's all sorts of different things. There's cuckolding, um, where uh, somebody actually gets sexual arousal from their partner having sex or being fucked by other partners. There's objectification, where uh, Dom will literally make the sub uh, a footstool that he rests his feet on, or uh, using the uh, sub's mouth as like a spitting bowl, or using the sub as a human toilet, and that's where you get into like golden showers and piss play and that kind of thing. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, so that was a lot. (laughs) I'm trying not to be judgmental. (laughs) Yeah, there's a bunch of different ways that people are interested in things for a bunch of different reasons, and as long as everybody's consenting and having a good time, I'm all for it. Yep. Well, there are a lot of studies that say that people who are in very high stress jobs or very powerful positions, um, actually, a surprising amount of them enjoy being in a submissive yeah. relationship. Typically, they're subs. Definitely. And Especially with uh, financial subspace. It's huge with people who are making obscene amounts of money. Hmm. And it just brings me to uh, kind of various uh, religious beliefs or also scientific beliefs that everything has to be in balance. Hmm. like in the world and kind of within yourself. So I wonder if there's a theory there that um, if you're in a position where you make a lot of decisions all the time, maybe in your private life or um, in your sexual life, you want to be in a situation where someone tells you what to do. Yeah. Or, or vice versa. If you're constantly being taken advantage of, maybe that's how you get very dominant. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. It's kind of personal 
that makes sense in your to health. me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I've got oh so many comments on what I just said in the golden showers given our current political scenario. Sure. I'm not gonna go down that road. <laughs> Again, I am the in P-tip. favor of if everybody is consenting, I am all for it. And if yeah. they're not, or if they're too young to consent, then that's super fucked up. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, are we talking about our? I thought we were talking about the president. Are we talking about the president or R. Kelly? Both. Different. Oh. Okay, yes. Both. Okay. <laughs> Different. Yeah. I mean. It makes me grossed out, but that doesn't mean. Well, it comes down to, I think, my fundamental belief is, again, consent. Everyone needs to be consenting. I think if someone's not consenting, that's the only time that an outside force should come in Mm -hmm. and say that this is not acceptable. But if all parties are consenting and of an age of consent, Mm -hmm. then who who cares? It doesn't bother me. I mean, it doesn't (laughs) affect me. It doesn't Mm -hmm. bother me. I do worry, I do hope they're taking proper precautions against pink eye and other <laughs> transmittable diseases. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Through certain waste matter, but yeah. I'm sure they are. Okay, I'm sure they I are. I believe in it. So yeah, piss play and um, scat play, I think it's a lot of like controversial negative attention and that's why we know about those things. Um, but mm. there's also uh, uh, vomit or bile. Um, and how that uh, comes into play is typically uh, with uh, uh, oral, like uh, deep impact oral play. Uh, a lot of people can get the uh, joy or sensation from um, like forcing someone to take a penis deeper, uh, which can create a gag reflex. So like the choking sound can be very erotic for some people. Um, yeah, and then and then sometimes bile happens, and I think. One of the interesting things about these forms of play that might make other people really grossed out is you have to think about the level of comfort between these two people that these things that we mark as gross are just like, oh, yeah, that happened and that's okay. And there's like no judgment and everything is really passive and we move on. Question. In terms of deep throating or gagging, how do safe words work? Safe actions. Okay. Um, so yeah you can determine like what is uh, it it depends on like uh, making a symbol with your hand or tapping or um, there's a bunch of different things that can happen depending on the scenario that you're in uh, so that you can say oh oh, nope I can't take this anymore and then one thing that I wanted to bring up here is the difference between a slave and a sub which is entirely a controversial topic. Um, (laughs) Basically, if somebody tells you that they're a sub or if somebody tells you that they're a slave, just take it for what it is because everybody kind of has a different definition of that. Um, Some people tend to lean towards the idea that a slave is more of a 24-7 relationship, will be people that are associated with like, Um, A dom tells them to clean the house, to run errands for them, to do all of these different things where it's like fully encompassing their life. Whereas uh, a sub in that scenario would be somebody who like during um, uh, sexual or romantic play, they play the sub or they take on a character for like maybe a pet play scenario or that kind of thing. Um, But that's hugely controversial. Some people consider themselves slaves in a BDSM aspect and they only interact in that way during that relationship. And I think that has a lot to do with like the intimate uh, names that uh, subs and doms have for each other. So, uh, yeah. So while I would like to be able to clearly say, this is a sub and this is a slave, slave, <laughs> it actually totally depends on the person. That makes sense, though. I mean, it seems like dub and som is a very personal... Dub and som? Dub and som? Mm-hmm. Nice. Sub and dom <laughs> <laughs> relationship is a very personal relationship where they know their rules and they have discussed everything thoroughly and how they define it is particular to those two and may not match any other relationship. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Similar to how relationships work. Oh yeah. It's like any relationship. <laughs> yeah, it's just a relationship and there can be a lot of love and affection between a dom and a sub or it can be a strictly sexual encounter, or it can have nothing at all to do with sex, and it can be a very friendship encounter. 
Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of different variations. And I think that's why it's so hard to do like a BDSM 101 conversation because mm. there are so many variations. But this is working. The very yeah, fact that you're saying there's so many variations. I'm learning things. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I think that's going to bring us into SM, which is uh, sadism and masochism. Um, oh, so like I mentioned earlier, it's the um, giving or receiving of pleasure from acts involving the receipt or infliction of pain or humiliation. Sadism uh, stems from the name the Marquis de Sade, who is very famous for his erotic works, um, where he depicts like... Uh, sexual uh, encounters or fantasies uh, using violence or suffering or that kind of thing. Um, So that's like sadism is the act of enjoying uh, inflicting pain. And then masochism is derived from another author, author, uh, and I'm going to butcher this name. So like, (laughs) let's just accept that now. Uh, Leopold, (laughs) Ritter von Sacher Masik, I guess is his name. Very famously the author of Venus and Furs. That is where a man was uh, basically gave uh, a woman the right to punish him as her slave as she deems best. So um, uh, masochism is the enjoyment of pain being inflicted on yourself. So like I said, there's a lot of crossover between sadism and masochism and discipline in the tools that are used. Um, So it can be uh, flogging and all of that kind of stuff again. Um, There's like pinwheels, there's... um, What's a pinwheel? Think of a pizza cutter. (laughs) Okay. You know know the things that they use to punch holes in leather? Oh yeah. Very similar. Yeah. So the the way that I was going to describe it is like, you know, everybody knows a, a, a pizza cutter, right? So it's like a stick that has a round wheel that cuts. Um, but instead of having it be a completely circular blade, imagine if it had um, spikes. So it's like mm-hmm. a circle of spikes. And sometimes they're very sharp and they're very pointed spikes, which can inflict pain in that way. Or sometimes they're very blunted or wide spikes. So it's more of like a just sensation on your skin. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that it isn't a constant sensation, that it's like whenever the next spike hits can be very interesting for people. Um, so, yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for calling me out for saying something that I, I just, just wanted assume to everybody know what it was. knows. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there's a lot of ways to inflict this as well. We've already touched on, uh, like bondage, uh, pain where you can put them in very, uh, complicated scenarios where you can tie, um, like long hair. If it's in a ponytail, you can tie it to somebody's ankle in a very uncomfortable position. So every time that they try to pull their ankle away or release the uncomfortable position, it pulls their hair more. Um, you can leave people hanging, um, either I, and I specifically said only in pissy play, but it actually also happens in anal play as well, where you can hook somebody by the, um, in the ass and have them hanging, um, from their ass. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different things. Um, this also includes, uh, like degradation and humiliation, which can include like, uh, but boot licking, piss play, like all of those different things. Um, name calling. There's like, there's a whole wide world of pain play. <laughs> <laughs> so that takes us through like BDSM. It's a really complex subject and there's a lot of stigma behind it. Um, because I think it wasn't until the 1980s that uh, psychologists determined that it wasn't um, just because people were into these specific kinks didn't necessarily make them insane or it wasn't like a mental health mm-hmm. thing. Um, it's only well, when... Um, I don't know. I, I feel like I should let you finish or I don't know if you want me to interrupt right now. Um, yeah, no, all I was saying... Let's let her finish. <laughs> um, no, all I was saying was it's very recent history that um, mm-hmm. it was taken out of... Um, that context and just kind of applied to you can have these um, interests as long as it's not taking over 
uh, Mm -hmm. your life. It's basically treated like addiction, really. Like, you're allowed to drink. It's when drinking takes over your entire life that it becomes a Mm -hmm. problem. Um, And it's very recently that we've changed our perception on kink and BDSM to kind of also include it in that kind of way. Um, But, yeah, Megan, what are your dates? (laughs) Give them to me, lady. So from what I can tell, the the psyche, um, this psychiatric uh, community is actually still torn on it. They haven't deemed it as uh, completely healthy yet. Um, it depends on which psychologist you talk to. So someone read a really interesting ar- article in Psychology Today, and they kind of go through the history of how um, BDSM became such a stigma. Mm-hmm. Now, they claim, and this is true, that Greek, ancient Greek art and the... Co- Kama Sutra both depict um, BDSM images, uh, ranking from full-on torture to uh, erotic spanking. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, European references go back to the 15th century, also featuring um, uh, torture, torture as sexually arousing. But again, and kind of like whenever you try and trace the origins of like grim fairy tales, like before you can only hear like whisperings without any like former thing organizing all these like villager stories into one piece of art until the Grimm brothers did it. Very similarly, you can kind of associate that with the uh, Marquis de Sade. As we mentioned earlier, the French Marquis de Sade um, published uh, one of the earliest SM novels, Justine. He published it in 1791. It included whipping, flogging, nipple clamping, and restraints. And uh, as Marcel pointed out earlier, his name is where we get the term sadism from. Um, However, de Sade was imprisoned for criminal insanity for an onslaught of reasons. And since he was deemed as criminally insane, the public found sadism to be criminally insane. Mm -hmm. Like, this one thing that he practiced, since he was crazy, then obviously the whole thing must be crazy. Kind of logic. And then uh, we already talked about uh, masochism. Mm -hmm. That book was published in 1791. We go through an entire century of um, various beliefs in sadism and masochism. It's hard. I was struggling this whole time, too. In 1905, Freud coined the word sadomasochism. Hello, Freud. Hello again. Calling it enjoyment neurotic. Freud, I think, is an interesting character because he was kind of the first person to study human sexuality scientifically, and he was actually ostracized from the scientific community for doing it. So, in terms of actually making human sexuality a legitimate science, go Freud. He got a lot of things wrong. Bad Freud. (laughs) So, take the good with the bad. I don't know. Um, So, he starts to kind of... Did not see sadomasochism as a healthy form Mm -hmm. of human sexuality. And since he was first, um, the various psychological journals went with his opinion on it. Um, The original Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders DSM. Yep. In 1952 classified sexual sadism as a deviation. The DSM number two, which came out in 1968, uh, did the same for masochism. And the DSM-4, which was released in 1994, lists um, sadomasochism as a psychiatric disorder. Mm, really, even mm-hmm. the DSM-4. I think we're on the 5 now, but uh, DSM-4 is still pretty standard. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, there are, there are certainly situations and certain people where a kind of sadomasochism does become disordered, like when you uh, listening to pomegranates and pitchforks, all these ser- serial killers certainly have uh, disordered sexual thinking, and they like to inflict uh, torture and sexual humiliation on people in a way that is obviously not consensual and very harmful. So, like, I get th- there is sort of a, I mean, it's tempting to say that there's a continuum there, but I think, like, um... well, I think it's exactly like what we were saying about like alcohol. It's like mm-hmm. if practice properly it's fine 
But Mm -hmm. yes, there are ways where it can be taken to the extreme and then be bad. All right. Yes. And it comes down to your intent. Like if your intent is to torture and humiliate someone rather than to arouse and please someone, then yeah, I think that's where... It all comes down, I think, to consent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, if yep, you yep. have yes. abducted someone <laughs> and you are sexually torturing them, that's fucked up. Unless in that's every your way. unless. Yeah, unless you came to an agreement beforehand, <laughs> right, right. I'm, you I'm know their blood. safe words. Yes. Right. This is all talked about and right. agreed if you, upon. If you agreed to be kidnapped. Yeah. Happens. It all totally comes happens. down to people the get paid all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like... <laughs> So, speaking of meeting beforehand and agreeing to terms, <laughs> a lot of people, yes. when they think of this, can picture the scene in Fifty Shades of Grey where they're negotiating the sex contract. Mm-hmm. I never read the book, but I did listen to the audiobook, and as they were going through this, I laughed out loud. <laughs> like, just the contract itself I found a little bit ridiculous, and like, especially all the terms. And, like, how it was phrased, I couldn't stand. And then as the book goes on, it kind of becomes repulsive because it's obviously an abusive relationship. It is not a, a consensual... Kink. Like, yeah. Yeah. A sub and dumb relationship. So, how are terms agreed upon? Like, is there an actual contract with everything written down? Or is it something totally that you depends. by it with memory? Totally depends. There's conversations that happen. Um, Some couples will plan entire scenarios, especially when you're talking about a dominatrix. Uh, The entire scenario is planned ahead of time. Um, So you're literally living out a fantasy. Other scenarios, you when you become a slave to somebody, you say, hey, I am your slave. I uh, hand over everything to you, like my life my actions in my life um my what i pursue like every part of me which can also include like i trust you with my life which is a major contributing factor to breath play for example you're literally saying like i trust you to not kill me and i'm gonna let you choke me if a sub ever feels unsafe then that's what safe words are for and safe actions are for but it totally depends on the on the participants yeah I think what I was talking about when I was saying like the 1980s it's when um, people started being more open about kink and sexual play and like talking about um, how things can be consenting and okay and you see a lot of this actually start with the gay communities specifically Leatherman Leatherman yeah I've got one of those yeah Um, yeah we all have one of those (laughs) from being in a wedding that one time yeah Uh, (laughs) yeah But yeah, so that's when people started, I I think, being more open about these things. Because when you look through history, there are multiple examples of plays, um, like The Virtuoso as early as 1690, where an old man would pay somebody in a brothel to inflict pain on him. And actually, at that time, it was thought that pain play was specifically done on older men. Um, in order to get the blood flowing because they need the extra stimulation in order to get it up. Um, And then later, there's another text that has a young man uh, receiving uh, that kind of pain play. And that was very shocking to the community because it wasn't necessarily considered as something that would be done to young men. Um, But yeah, there's like examples all throughout history of people being interested in these kinds of things. Obviously, like Shibari Shibari and Kambaku goes uh, back very far. Um, Right, we have those woodblock prints. Yes. And if I may interject, uh, if you've ever read James Joyce's love letters, if you admire his writing, definitely look up his his love letters because he's got some, some, he and his wife were up to some real kinky shenanigans. They were some dirty old dogs. It's a hoot. (laughs) (laughs) A little more accessible than Ulysses. Sorry, I had to throw a joke there. Uh, no, I was going to say you see a lot more um, 
art and pornography begin to pop up in the 1800s and the 19th century um, uh, that includes all of these different forms of like uh, BDSM and that kind of thing. And what's fascinating to me is after specific periods, um, historical instances then become eroticized. So um, something that I found fascinating by the author of a history of BDSM.com. I think that's what I, yeah, history of BDSM.com. Um, he talks about how Uncle Tom's cabin was eroticized um, and how, uh, yeah, slavery, um, American slavery is eroticized shortly after the time period and how there's a lot of conflict and societal conflict about uh, using the term slavery, obviously, especially in the Americas. Um, but yeah, it's all right. it's all part of the history, and it happens through different scenarios throughout time as well. I think another one that they included it was like a different country's independence, and then after the independence, then the sexualization of like be, the imperial. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it happens all throughout time in ah. history. <laughs> An erotic nice. French Revolution. I want to do an erotic <laughs> yeah. uh, Treaty of Versailles. I could, do, <laughs> I could do an erotic version of the War of 1812. Nice. We'll Burned down my White House. house. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that you guys that's, are that's... like exploring your sexual fantasies. Yes. Yeah, in front of you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in front of now, I, all of our listeners. In front of yeah. the world. <laughs> oh, it's super interesting. So... Here's a question and a half. Well, okay, hold on, sorry. <laughs> but I, I did just ha- have an interesting thought. I mean, think of how many sexy history shows there are out there. There's like sexy tutors, sexy Borgias, sexy Romans. It, was, it kind of makes sense that we romanticize and eroticize like moments in history. I just think that's really fascinating. Yeah. That's it. That's, that's all I had. <laughs> sexy Queen Victoria. I had another one. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I do like... I, I don't necessarily have a very good pain threshold, and I bruise like a peach, so there are a lot of things that I don't really participate in, but I do find a lot of the um, BDSM artwork beautiful. Not necessarily sexually arousing, but fantastic. Like, um, all, the, all the images we saw of Kimbaku while we were researching it are fantastic, and then um, there's a photographer, uh, Robert Ma- Maplethorpe, who is a famous leather daddy photographer. Yeah. Hmm who's absolutely beautiful. So I think um, it it all comes down to a sentiment that I think is very common and why BDSM, the movement to be out and open about it is so associated with the pride movement is... um, It was all considered sexual deviancy. (laughs) Yeah, Mm -hmm. and like trying to get rid of sexual deviancy in terms of like just because you don't particularly do a thing it doesn't necessarily mean everybody else can't do the thing yeah i like well that said. i like that <laughs> sentence <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just because you can't or don't want to do the thing doesn't mean that the thing is bad yeah exactly <laughs> um that being said interesting discussion topic at what age do we think people should start exploring bdsm Because there is a moral part of me that's like, teenagers should not be doing this. Is that a right thought, or...? Well, they're already playing the pass-out game, which is nine-tenths of the way there. I'm sorry. Um, I am too old to know what the hell you're talking about. (laughs) Oh, that was something people did when we were in high school. I'm sorry! You just hold your breath until you pass out. I guess teenagers also do, like, the cinnamon challenge. Because because the oxy- oxygen deprivation gives you a rush, so you just like choke yourself or uh, hold your breath until you pass out. You basically get high. I mean, I'm not like going to disagree with you. Oxygen deprivation <laughs> does cause a rush. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised. Uh, uh, so yeah, I kind of agree with Megan here. I think that it's um, 
I'm coming specifically from a safety perspective. I mm-hmm. I mean, I'm yeah. sure that that's also where Megan is coming from. But like, I really want to highlight for safety reasons, I would say that I probably wouldn't allow or want <laughs> teenagers to be playing with specific BDSM practices um, entirely because I think the maturity level isn't there. Um especially if you're dealing with pain play or breath play or anything that could be very dangerous. Um, Also, I think uh, degradation and humiliation probably isn't good for teenagers just because there's so much already happening emotionally and with hormones inside of a teenage body that um, you're constantly comparing yourself to everybody outside of you anyway. Mm -hmm. And probably being called a dirty little slut or a whore isn't going to make you feel any better. (laughs) Maybe it makes you feel great. That's great. (laughs) But I think that it could also... um, yeah, may not might not psychologically be the best thing for a young teenager. So I'm wondering, I, we talked about how BDSM doesn't always have to be sexual. It doesn't always have to be penetrative, but a lot of it is. So do you need to like explore your own sexuality? And when you feel ready for it, that's when you go into it. Um. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. I think that. That's hard for me to say because I will admit that, like, I never really explored my sexuality with myself before exploring sexuality with partner play. Um, That just wasn't Uh part of my journey. Um, But I do think that it would probably be very healthy. But even then, I think that uh, teenagers are still too young because you see a lot of uh accidental deaths from autoerotic asphyxiation um yes you do so yeah i think that it's just uh yeah everything's a little bit dangerous (laughs) (laughs) yeah teenagers are not known for their decision making yeah i certainly and that's with no shade all three of us have made some pretty dumbass decisions oh, yeah. in our life. No, it's I mean, it's literally a <laughs> developmental thing. Like yeah. you're 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 still learning. Not only are you learning how to make good decisions, but you like that part of your brain that is part that is uh, um, impulse control is still developing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why. Like, I feel like teenagers get a lot of shade thrown at them for yeah reasons. I mean, teenagers are also. Because the old always blame the young. The old always blame the young, but really, I think that when it comes to <laughs> everything you do in life is a skill. Like you had to learn how to walk, you had to learn how to talk, you had to learn to play the piano, you had to learn how to do math. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have to learn your body, and you have to learn how to have sex, and you have to learn like everything else associated with it. Mm-hmm. So I think having like certain skills set up before you go into BDSM as like a, a, a platform if that makes sense sure <laughs> I think it's all <laughs> a journey <laughs> I th- yeah I think I, I know what you're saying like you before getting into something like this you need to have really good communication yeah. skills yeah. Uh, really good self-control especially if you're the dom and um, like a really thorough understanding of consent in every aspect of of your life. Yeah. Um, I can see why BDSM is not part of, like, the base sex education. Um, but I do think that there needs to be a discussion on um, alternative sexual preferences. Like, maybe in your senior year. Yeah. Yeah. I think so, like, that it's like... more about just telling people that um, kinks are out there... Yeah. And that you're not bad or wrong or shameful for having them. I think that's what I um, wish was included in sex ed was like telling people like, hey, stop passing judgment. We all have these different things and it's okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm not exactly expecting, you know, a sex ed teacher to teach people what a humbler is. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it might feel a little too much. But it would be good if, like, sex ed classes were able to build that foundation for more advanced sexual play uh, as one becomes an adult. Uh, yeah, I think, especially if there was... Sex ed seems like the perfect place for people to discuss consent. 
mm-hmm. and communication. And that can be applied to like, literally everything. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And trust. Applied, yeah. um, you, can't, yeah. Yeah. you can't have BDSM without extreme levels of trust. Right. Yes. Yeah. And if you do have BDSM without extreme levels of trust, that's not BDSM. That's illegal. <laughs> I'm like nodding hey, and realizing is. that that's not auditory yeah. or helpful at all. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it was a slow nod. It was a nod with the mm-hmm. arched eyebrows mm-hmm. of, we agree. <laughs> yes. Anything else from the peanut gallery? <laughs> no. 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 Do your social media bit. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, hey, listeners, thanks for listening to another episode of Remedial Sex Ed. Um, make sure to like and subscribe. Follow us on all the social medias. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So if you can follow us there, that'd be great. You can always shoot us a question. Talk to us. Tell us what you think. Uh, if you have a suggestion for an episode or a comment on a previous episode, please, politely, uh, talk to us or... If you don't want to reach out publicly, you can always send us an email, remedialsexed at gmail.com. Um, and please, please, please leave us a review. We will shout you out. We will sing your praises. I am Megan. I am Marcella. And I'm Colin. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. You will agree that the concepts will contribute to the rearing of a mature person. Um, an absence of... Oh, yeah. You don't have to be thinking about that.